Alrighty, we're going to go ahead and get things kicked off with today's webinar. Appreciate everybody who's joined us uh, from the YMCA world today uh, for our webinar on tips to better manage your operations today and for the future. My name is Earl Lang. Uh, I'm a senior integrated marketing manager here with Dude Solutions, and I'm going to be moderating today's event. Uh, we know how busy you are. We know how crazy the world is. So we, we certainly appreciate you taking some time out to join us today. Um, I'm going to get into some quick housekeeping and then introduce our speakers. Um, and from there, we'll pass it off to them to take you through the bulk of today's presentation. Um, first and foremost, phone lines have been muted for today's presentation. Um, we don't want that to discourage, discourage participation from you, though. So we do encourage you, if you have a um, question throughout the event, there is a Q&A feature towards the bottom of your screen. Um, please click on that. Um, I'll be monitoring those questions throughout. So if you have any technical issues or just questions you would like our speakers to address towards the end of the webinar, we'll be on the lookout for that and address anything um, upon conclusion of today's event. Um, and to go ahead and head off the most common question we often get, um, the session is being recorded um, for any of those who have registered and are unable to make it today um, or attended today, we'll follow up with the recording directly via email um, so you make sure you can get that and share it with any peers you'd like to pass it on to. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our speakers for today. Um, first joining us, we've got uh, Rick Cohen, who is the Property Director at Fond du Lac Family YMCA. Um, Rick has been a YMCA facilities professional for the past 30 years um, and has worked at associations in both Iowa and Wisconsin. He's the Property Director at Fond du Lac Family YMCA and leads the Wisconsin uh, Michigan, or Wisconsin UP Michigan Facilities Peer Community Network. Um, we appreciate Rick joining us today. We've also got Will Goins, who's the Senior Property Director with the YMCA of Western North Carolina. Will is a fifth generation laborer and tradesman who's currently living in Black Mountain, North Carolina area. Holds the title of Senior Property Director with YMCA of Western North Carolina, um, who he's worked with for over 10 years. Um, Will has a Master's in Fine Arts uh, and a Bachelor's Degree in Philosophy and brings an alternative perspective uh, to systemic building maintenance. Um, in his off time, he enjoys hiking, fishing, and building structures with his wife and two daughters. And last but not least, we've got Mary Beth Ormiston. Um, who anybody who's attended a DUDE membership uh, webinar before has, has oftentimes heard from. Mary Beth's an expert in risk management, um, and in addition to working with DUDE Solutions, is owner of MBO Consulting LLC, where she offers enterprise risk management consulting um, services and uh, to youth serving and family organizations like YMCA. Uh, she also provides an investigative expert services for insurance losses um, and is a judicial expert witness in the area of aquatics and child abuse. So have a loaded panel for you guys today um, to take us through. Uh, so without um, further delay, I'm gonna hand this off to Mary Beth, who's gonna take you through the agenda um, in the first part of today's presentation. Mary Beth. Hi everyone, I'm delighted to be here with you. We're gonna move kind of quickly today, but I wanted to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about and then we'll be able to hear from our guest panelists and then go into some questions and answers. So we have a lot that we have to cover. But I do wanna just uh, highlight what we want to talk about today. As we manage our operations today and for the future, there's lots of topics that we need to uh, spend some time talking about. And one of them is tracking your work, optimizing janitorial processes, which is so important uh, to understand from where we've been to where we're going. And the importance of digital um, as we talk about compliance documentation and from again from what we knew before to where we're going now and to where we're even going further into the future, the importance of documentation. And how is it that we're planning for deferred maintenance? Uh, we know that that is a huge issue with facilities being closed, some reopening, some being perhaps permanently closed and the importance of our team and how is it that we keep them involved and how is it that we train them. And then a new concept that many of us are just learning to get our arms around and that's the ability to work remotely. So let's just dive right into this. 
These are the 10 tips to manage COVID-19, where we are today and where we hope to go for the future. And we're hoping today to give you some actionable steps that will help you with your efficiencies. We're gonna very quickly, Earl's gonna take a poll here and you can read the poll. And uh, as you answer that, I'm going to keep right on moving here and then we'll come back to that uh, as we do so. Oh, poll is now live, everyone. So if you wanna just uh, select the options we've got there, just curious to see how your organization is operating currently uh, in the midst and kind of, uh, you know, fall out from the pandemic. So just fill that out really quickly and we'll share those results here in a moment. Okay. Give you a couple more seconds. And Earl, we should be pretty good to go, I think. And we can see the results there. Uh, we see that we have a large uh, line and reduced membership uh, occupancy which is what I'm hearing across the board. Thank you, thank you for doing that. All right, moving ahead. And I'm trying to get us moved here. I'm not moving, there we go. We're gonna talk about our new normal. When we talk about the new normal, I'm not sure that we are in the new normal, but we are different from where we are. So we have to talk about where are we and how do we operate within it. And of course, we're gonna talk about what's next. How do we adjust now to the post COVID operations, which is now that is going to take us into the future and tips for gaining efficiencies for today and in the future. So here we go. We're gonna first talk about tracking your work, which is so important. Tracking and tagging work orders. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important on a several different um, avenues, particularly because we're dealing with the spread of infection. It's important as we talk about our janitorial tasks that we are documenting and that we're organizing them because this is pivotal to the very success of what we're trying to do in the Y space. It's also important that by organizing and doing our documentation, we can group our work together. That gives us some clarity, helps us with decision making and budgeting, which is what we're coming into at this time of the year. Many of you are on the calendar year and we have to get a handle on what has the last six months look like because it's been different. Well, by organizing our work, it begins to give us some answers as to what we need to do. What do we do now? You know, if we can begin by tagging our COVID-19 related work in your CMMS is the first thing to start with. And if you haven't done that, uh, we would suggest that you do this. That allows us then to go to the next step, which is to track the cost that's been associated with COVID-19 work. As we move forward into the last quarter of the year, as we move forward into the new year of understanding what we have done is going to be very important in your operation. Never before has data, in my opinion, been more important in making future decisions because we've had buildings that closed, we've had staff layoffs, we've had members that haven't been coming back. We have to understand what it's going to take to push us into our next era. So what do we do for this future? Well, here are some ideas of pulling and sharing reports that can be specific to COVID-19. Your work orders being completed, looking at your workload analysis, your PM analyses, your PM monthly forecast, and then again, your response time analyses. These are all important things as we look for the future. And the system that you have is going to allow you to have that um, information. Digital compliance documentation. We've talked about this for a long time, but we didn't know that we were going to be faced with a pandemic, did we? We didn't know how important, we thought we knew how important uh, documentation was going to be, but compliant regulations as we knew them are completely changing. And what we're doing today I don't know next week whether they're going to be changed again and whether they're going to be changed again. If we have all of our compliance documentation digitally uh, prepared, it allows us to stay on top of what we need to do. And then how are you documenting today to make it easier 
to move forward in the future and making it easier for your team to understand. Well, now we add our safety protocols in your CMMS and you have safety nodes and you've got your clean checklist and you can attach to work orders and assets. But going future, we can then pull our compliance related reports. We have them. We know what we've done and we know where we have to go. And it allows us the opportunity as we get to it later on in the presentation of our training of our team. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools and how they tie into what we're doing. And the first one I want to talk about is asset essentials. Now it's important that not only you, but whoever uses assets knows what you have. Do you have, do you completely know what you're doing with it? Know what you need and know when you need to use it. That's part of the importance of what assets can do for you. Moving ahead with that, now we're going to deal a little bit with deferred maintenance. I have to tell you of all the questions that I, uh, I'm asking the why, one of the most critical one has to do with deferred maintenance because our maintenance um, list is actually piling up. Some of you have been able to, during this close down, to be able to work on it. And depending on your state, depending on your mandates, depending on all circumstances, we know every why is different. But I'm hearing that the deferred maintenance has been piling up. Some of it because of lack of financial resources of being closed. So now we need to make uh, and, and get our arms around this. So plan on what is it that you can tackle. I talk to people all the time, you know, we've got a big pizza. We can't eat this big pizza all at once. We are going to have to take it in smaller bites, but we have to decide, are you going to eat the pepperoni first? Or are you going to eat something else first? We have to figure out what has the biggest impact. So if you're looking at your deferred maintenance, the question is, you know, what do you do now? And what do you do for the future? Well, I suggest that you prioritize your deferred maintenance list. This can be tough. You have to figure out what is it that you really actually have to do now? What are those things that are crucial? Another piece of this is this is information that also needs to be shared with your leadership. The kinds of information that you are uh, calculating, that you are working on is essential for other layers of the organization to make decisions. Uh, and so share this information with your supervisor, your CEO, whomever it is that needs this. For the future, we have to evaluate our capital forecasting process because nothing stays the same. So as we take a look at what's now, our future part is how do we look at the capital forecasting process? So as we talk about the tools that allow us to do that, our here at DUDE, our capital planning and our forecasting software can help you predict and also prioritize your operations and your, uh, your maintenance projects based on your asset lifestyle and over your 20 years of data. Our system alone helps manage over 125,000 capital needs. And as you move forward in the future, to be able to do this with our buildings is going to make a big difference in the, the, uh, the, uh, what we want to do me moving forward. So I urge us to understand that. Here's where things get sometimes a little dicey because we have a team or maybe we had a team and maybe we have new teams. So why is it that we need to prioritize training for your team? Well, part of it is because we may not have everybody in the same location. We may not have everybody working the same time. But training is a way to keep that connection with our staff. It's also a way to keep them informed, um, keeping them moving forward, and being part of this team of which we need so badly. Now, virtual training is, is the thing that we're doing right now. We can do that on different processes. And you know, training doesn't have to be for an hour. Training could be for 10 minutes. 
training could be on their own time because we have technology and we have systems and because we're doing things different. We can be creative and at the same time, make sure that everybody, though not sitting in the same room perhaps, can be connected and we can continue that learning process. Training our teams and, and what is it that we can, we can do now? Well, if we have team review safety protocols, what we're really trying to center in and what we're trying to learn are, are what are the protocols to help us um, avoid the spread of this disease? Which means that our protocols, as we develop protocols, here's what I like to say about this. We're not developing protocols that we're going to use 50% of the time. Uh-uh, we're not doing that. We are learning and reviewing and implementing protocols that we can do 100% of the time that we can be consistent and that we can sustain. And that's why we need to have team reviews because if we can't be consistent and we can't sustain them, then we need to look at something different. So have we thought about our vendors? Our vendors want to help us. So let's reach out and have them be involved in the process and get to know all of our software better. The more you know about the software, the better you can spend your time and get the results that you need. Now we here at DUDE, we're here for you. We have many different avenues that will help you expand and can improve upon your software experience. Uh, we can help you with any system, we can configure, we can train, we can do any enter data. We'll do what it is that you want us to do. And if you haven't utilized the DUDE's legendary support system, I urge you, if you need help, to come right to our, our support desk. We have uh, trainings available. We have guides. We have things on our web page. We will help you any way that's possible. And if you haven't scheduled an account review with your client success manager, uh, I, success, I uh, really would ask that you may consider doing that. It would be a great help. You can have that one-on-one -on -one, and together you can figure out too where it is that you need to go and what kind of services you might need. But also explore professional consulting services if that's what you need. If you need one-on-one, -on -one, we would uh, be delighted to have those conversations. Can't say it enough, the dude is beside you. We're here for you. We want you to be successful. So saying that, how is it that we improve our ability to work remotely? Because I mean, this is all different. Uh, I'm not used to working remotely as you are. I'm used to being out, talking to people, uh, being with a team, you know, having conversations and working together. Well, when we have remote work capabilities, if we have them set up right, it allows us to be a better at what we do. So our staff needs to have the, uh, the flexibility um, to do their work where they are. And, um, and we need to understand how different people work remotely. Uh, this one we've said for a long time, paper-based processes won't hold up. You know, uh, those little scraps of paper, all those things that we've done over the years um, aren't going to cut it. Let's try to get all of our staff uh, in our software and have them technically, uh, a, 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 have the technical abilities to be successful. Work from anywhere does require cloud and mobile technology. So we need to make sure that our folks and everybody has that. And at the same time, everything that we do, even remotely, that we are supporting social distancing and or supporting whatever our state mandates are. And that's the other thing that I'd like to just spend two seconds on is to make sure that your team understands the state mandates because they change periodically. Um, every state is different and we need to be in tune with what those changes are and understanding the nuances of, of what they are. Because sometimes we have to be kind of entrepreneurial as we move forward. And when we do that, um, that allows then for the whole team of needing to come together to explore what might work and what might not. So what do we do now? 
Well, one of the first things that we can do is mobilize your technology, like you have your CMMS and other software solutions. Make sure that we, you're mobilized so that you can do what you need to do. Some people have company devices, others have personal. It's really, I think it's important that you decide on one or the other. Uh, if, if you're gonna use a company device or personal devices, uh, take a look at what works best for your association and then go with that. Managing your team is, is another issue because we're not used to doing that remotely. You know, this isn't something that we can pick up the phone and we're going to uh, uh, manage minutely and that we're going to uh, manage uh, with not, it, it's different when we don't see people and we're not sure what they're doing. Well, that's why uh, it's important to have the status and lo location of your team. You know, that's that essential versus non-essential, your work from home classification, so that you know um, how people are working and where they are in the process. This is part of managing your team effect effectively and efficiently. Uh, remote work is really about intelligent uh, routing and notification. You know, we have the systems, you know what they are. So if we have solid workflow, which we know is escalation and notification, because you have less face to face, but we have the means to intelligently route all of our work orders, we can do that. We know we have 24 seven notification. So we have everything that we need to be effective as we work remotely. The biggest issue is that it's different. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about communication because never before has communication been more important. We can't assume that everybody understands via a, a computer or via an email um, that we have communi communicated the same thing with everybody because we all hear and read things differently. So work on our communication to make sure that we're taking the time to update the CMMS and we're adding those special instructions. We're not assuming that people know that we have all of our safety documentations complete. Now we can, we can rely on video and pictures and all of the printed documentation. We have dashboards and all other updates to keep teams informed. But I think what we want to emphasize here is that to figure out by talking to your team what works best, we have the capabilities to work remotely on a, a lot of, of different fields and, and using different methods. And I encourage you to do that. Now, we don't know what the future is going to look like, but our guess is that we're going to continue to do uh, remote work as we, as we look forward. So that may mean that you need to invest in other or more appropriate tools to help with the technology. If, if the future is different than where we are now, perhaps our current technology needs to be updated to keep us to where we want to be. Uh, specifically those that are better enable you to improve the mobile and remote capabilities, I would move to the top of the list because that is still where our space is going to be. We don't know um, after the first of the year, are we all going to be back in our buildings 100%? Are we, what are our programs going to look like? How many of our buildings are we going to be able to open? Because as you know, some, some associations are closing buildings permanently. So we need to have uh, the capabilities to do what our new, um, what they call the new norm, whatever that's going to be um, as we look towards the future. Our tool, our, our tool die-in, as you know, all of our dude solution products, they're all cloud-based and they're very secure. And one of the reasons that we're really talking about this is because of the mo their mobile and the accessibility, which I think is so important to all of you, uh, because this allows you to move, get work done, report, and be able to keep in touch with everyone. So we're, we're working smart and we're working efficiently and we have the effective tools that we can report out, which our management is going to need more than ever before. 
So be ready for what's next. We kind of think that we've, we've got a little sense of what's coming next. So if I were to give you and dude were to give you any suggestions, we would say, make the small improvements for efficiencies right now. Again, let's take some small steps. Let's not stay where we are. Let's take those small steps to move forward. But then give thought and involve others in how we're thinking about our plan for improving the future. If nothing else, it, this, this whole COVID thing has allowed us to think differently. It's allowed us perhaps to look at systems and efficiencies that we've never had the chance to look at. And I think that's good. And if we can take that viewpoint, then we can continue to move forward. And as you move forward, the dude is going to be right here beside you. We're not going anywhere. Now, we have a, a second tool, a second poll here that Earl is going to instigate. And you have the questions. So we'll give you a couple of seconds to read through those and answer. Poll is live, Mary Beth. Uh, for anybody on the, the call right now, this is just if, if anything, um, you heard today piqued your interest and you'd like to learn more about how the dude can help you with that. This is just a way to, to kind of raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to learn more about that. So poll will remain live for approximately 15 more seconds or so. And uh, then we will segue right into the Q&A uh, with our, our uh, esteemed guests who have joined us today. Great. And thank you all for um, participating in our polls. Uh, we think it's helpful because we want to help you. All right, let's. Uh, oh, we're good. We're good. All right, let's move on then. Let's see if I can get us to move on. Got to get the screen to move. There we go. Now we're going to talk with our guests that we have with us. And as Earl introduced, we have Rick and Will. And we have some questions that we have prepared that we're going to ask them. And again, I might suggest that we know that we're going to have unfinished business with our, with our webinar. And we are more than willing at any time to have one-offs and talk. But our first discussion question is, each organization was different in the parameters of their lockdown. And how was your department and team and staff affected? And how did that affect your normal processes and workflow? And I think, uh, Will, maybe you're starting with this. Is that right? Sure, most definitely. Thank you, Mary Beth. Well, um, without a doubt, normal processes and workflow went right out the window as soon as we had to you know, shut down um, our, our direct service for the community. We went out into the into the community and served over 211 pounds of fresh produce to children. We were providing emergency childcare for, for kids and, and we were out in the community. And our building was left uh, without any members in it and, and basically just us. So um, we had to first, like you were saying before, we had to really prioritize the deferred maintenance, looking at the costs, uh, looking at what could be done um, with supplies on hand. And you showed your inventory tracking tool. Um, that was a key part of it. Um, keeping your inventory up, um, we were able to do a lot of repairs that needed to be done just because we had the supplies on hand. Um, we made sure to log what had been used. And, uh, you know, when the money comes back in, we're going to be able to uh, kind of build that inventory again. But um, another big thing was just making sure that we really cleaned everything systematically. So we created work orders um, for every single area in the building. And as they were being completed, we knocked them out. And that made sure that number one is being documented. And number two, we weren't really missing anything at all. Um, certain PMs, uh, certain of our planned maintenance uh, work orders, um, they weren't pertinent anymore because our um, hot tub wasn't being operated, you know, our uh, steam rooms weren't being operated. Um, so I, I discontinued those PMs and instead I created new PMs. Um, just looking at uh, making sure that I'm, I'm getting all my filters changed for uh, MERV 11 or MERV 16 or what, whatever you're at, you know, whatever your uh, CDC recommendations uh, uh, recommend for air filtration, um, documenting that all that's done. So. Um, the, the whole thing changed, but uh, Facility Dude was a great tool in tracking and um, 
documenting everything that needed to change. Great. Well, those are, uh, thanks for your comments there. Rick, what would you say about this? Well, we were anticipating that we would have a lockdown coming. You know, we'd been hearing this. We had our advocate and our, our, our lobbyist for the state, uh, for our state YMCA group was on our, on our daily calls. Uh, and, you know, we knew it was coming. We just didn't know when and to what degree. Um, but we began to prepare for some different scenarios. Could we remain open with limited capacities? That was a possibility. Or would we need to shut down completely? and maybe keep some areas open. Uh, once the order did come down from the state, uh, it came down with a two-day notice that we were going to be closed in two days. So uh, we did have some steps in place already. We had our marketing team was all ready to, to um, communicate that out to the masses. And then we did keep the child care open because child cares could remain open for essential workers. And we had people other than our normal attendees to child care uh, were, in, were utilizing our child care because many others in, the, in our community had closed down. In the early stages of the, lock, of the lockdown, we didn't have a lot of effect on what we were doing as far as this department goes. Uh, we were anticipating this is going to be short. You know, we thought, nah, in another month or two, we're gonna be open again. Um, as it turned out, we were closed for two and a half months, but we took that, we took advantage of that early stage. We still had, we still kept a full complement of custodial staff on, our maintenance techs were still on, and we just continued kind of business as usual, did a lot of deep cleaning, uh, as Will said, you know, that real systematic type of cleaning, so that in the event that we were going to open soon, we would be ready. Uh, took care of some, some things like hard floor maintenance, carpet extractions, more of that project type work. Uh, you know, we, we were able to catch up um, on some of our projects and chip away at our building backlog. We weren't closed outside vendors, so we said, well, now's the time to get in some vendors to make some repairs in some locker rooms and areas like that. So that was helpful. Um, again, we were we were still anticipating that this is gonna be short and, and we're gonna be open within a couple of months. We continued on with our critical maintenance tasks such as changing filters and our fire system inspections and cleaning coils and things like that. And also got to jump on some things that are scheduled for later in the season, um, but it was a good time to go ahead and do some coil cleaning and things like that because we did have the time. Uh, I guess the one thing that I would like to say is that we, we viewed it as we're still operating our facility. And we looked around and we saw some facilities that, that had the idea that, well, we're just going to turn off the switch and lock the doors. And our point is that, well, a facility needs to be operated. So we still monitored things in our facility. Uh, we were able to do some work from home. So we we reviewed our CMMS uh, plan maintenance schedules, equipment files and dashboards, made the appropriate updates where needed there. Really owned the building automation system on, on what could we do to save some energy dollars here during this time by adjusting time of day schedules and set points and things like that. And then we put our pools to sleep, and lowered our temperatures and turnover rate uh, we determined that our energy savings by doing this would outweigh the cost of replacing the water if the pools were drained. Uh, we would have had to have been closed for a long time before it would have paid for us to drain the pools. Uh, so we took that route and it worked out very well for us. Thanks, Rick. And well, those are great, great answers. Let's go on um, to the next question. Thank you for those comments. What were the biggest challenges you faced as the pandemic started impacting your organization? And how did you prioritize and address those challenges in the early and later phases of the pandemic? So is this, Rick, are you gonna start us off on this one? Yep, I can start us off. I think the biggest challenge began with, you know, what are the, you know, there were so many unknowns. We didn't know 
if we were going to need to shut down, when that would happen or how long it would last. Um, and what is our facility going to look like when we reopen? Uh, oftentimes the recommendations from the CDC, the state, the county health departments were quite broad. So it was difficult and we asked a lot of questions and looked for a lot of direction and we got kind of the same broad answers. So um, our leadership team met daily for two to three hours and that's a leadership team of six of us. And um, during our shutdown, we worked on what is our phase one reopening going to look like. Uh, we knew the building wasn't going to be the same and our biggest challenge at that point was uh, where are we going to get all these supplies that, are, that we're going to need? What if we opened here uh, in a short time and we didn't have our physical distance barriers for around our front desk or reception desk and things like that? Uh, we're going to start positioning equipment so that we could uh, be ready when we opened for social distancing. So we had to move fitness equipment here and there and and spread them out in our wellness center, move some down to a gymnasium and things like that. Get rid of all of our, all of our social area uh, furniture and put that into storage. So then we started to prioritize what we needed to do to safely reopen for our staff and membership. And I think you mentioned it, it starts with a lot of training. Uh, do we have enough uh, PPE and supplies for all of our staff and all these supplies that we need to open the facility? Uh, some staff are going to be reassigned to other duties and tasks. Through this process, uh, we had to make the difficult decision to furlough some staff. Because once we got through the first month, we had gotten caught up on a lot of things. So we were operating with a, with a pretty uh, skeleton staff at that time, not just, not just this department, but uh, the entire Y staff. So to finish it off, to, to help us prepare for reopening, we contacted the county health department director to go through our facility with us the week prior to open. And that was very helpful and helped uh, confirm that we were taking the proper steps to reopen and also helped us identify some additional recommendations that she may have. So we felt very confident when we reopened that it was going to be safe, uh, that members, uh, we, you know, we, we certainly knew that it was gonna be different. Um, but we communicated all that to the membership and and our, our reopening really did go rather smoothly. Thanks, Rick. Those are great comments. Appreciate hearing that. Will, how about you? Would you like to respond to this question also for us? Sure, I've got a little something. So um, I would totally agree with everything Rick said. Um, a lot of our processes were exactly the same. Um, you know, trying to prepare for different scenarios for reopening and, and not knowing which one's going to happen. Um, so you need the supplies to do that and, and try to grab those supplies while you can. Um, you know, a big part of the challenge that, that I had that uh, you had mentioned before, Mary Beth, was communicating with supervisors and staff when they're not on site at the same time. So um, we were able to keep staff on, but um, just trying to social distance and, and prevent a scenario where, you know, where everyone would have to be quarantined or something like that. Um, I had to communicate via mostly emails and facility dude. So making sure to assign work orders to different staff, making sure that you're constantly prioritizing uh, those work orders, um, pulling reports of what's been done um, on a daily and weekly basis, just to make sure that we're, we're communicating uh, that work is being done, um, you know, logging work hours associated with, with each of the, uh, the work orders. And, and that's another good way, like you said before, you're documenting your costs. Well, you have the material costs, but you also have your labor costs. And, um, you know, showing, hey, these people are, are working on stuff and you're not seeing it, but here it is and it's happening, um, is, is a great way of, of keeping track of what's happening and uh, who's doing what. Great comments, thank you. Well, let's move on to the next question, which is how long did it take you to identify and implement the processes necessary to support your work given the need for social distancing? Uh, Will, would you, are you next up, I think, on this? Sure, so identify and implement processes. Okay, um, 
you know, we had certain staff that maybe were working at a certain, at one location and then we're switching to another location just due to staffing changes. Um, and facility do was really easy on changing that. Basically you could just change permissions um, for, for different users. And then they have access to our whole other um, facilities work orders, you know? So that was helpful um, just with all the different staffing transitions. Um, we did have to bring in new technicians. Some folks were furloughed, laid off. Some folks didn't come back and we had new people come on. Uh, so it was a great time to not only train those new people, but um, just reinforce the training on the folks that are sticking around. So I did a lot of work one-on-one uh, -on -one through Zoom um, on just different processes, not only um, technical processes that are happening in the facility, but also cleaning because we want to make sure that that cleaning was done a particular way with certain chemicals, with certain dwell times and, you know, making sure that it was done in a safe manner. And um, so we implemented a um, systemic uh, training that went out to every single one of our uh, staff people. Uh, and it was a video and there was like a QA, and a and, and then they documented that they completed it. Um, but we were able to do that with folks that were staying at home. And, um, and then when they came back to the center, they were ready to go on day one. And we didn't know when day one was gonna be. So we needed to do it, you know, from afar. Um, you know, I'd say, I'd, I'd say that's, that's mostly what I have on that one. Great, great comments. Thanks for sharing that. Rick, how about you? We didn't need to change uh, many processes in the beginning. And our facility was closed. The only people that were in the facility at that time was you know, the CEO or myself, um, maintenance techs and custodial staff. We basically shut the building down completely. And then we were, we were in uh, doing our work. So custodial staff had their own assigned areas, maintenance staff, same thing, working on their projects. So we didn't really change uh, anything on their shifts uh, because we had the facility closed. Uh, when it came time to conduct staff meetings, we started out by having, uh, with our custodial staff and maintenance staff, we started out by having those meetings in a large multi-purpose room where, where it was easy to social distance. And we did understand the further that we went through this process that some people were not feeling as comfortable as others, uh, maybe wanted to just stay home. And they really did pick up the um, the virtual meetings rather quickly and you know we don't typically some of our staff aren't um, real high on technology but uh, they did a very good job of picking that up and, and were able to dial in on their phone things like that uh, we conduct our, our regular leadership meeting our, our leadership staff meetings were done virtually whether two or three of us were in the building or not uh, we 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 still did a, did a zoom call for those meetings and of course, all of our board meetings and committee meetings are conducted virtually and have been ever since March. So um, you know, even took it to the point of, of connecting with some vendors on Zoom. Uh, these are people that you know, we would have face-to-face -face meetings occasionally, you know, so uh, we would just go ahead and connect on Zoom. And I think that was, that was real helpful and, and I think very well received by everyone. Well, thank you for your comments. We certainly are learning to work and communicate and function differently. Along that same theme, let's talk about what do your short and mid and long-term plans in this aftermath look like as we go forward? Uh, Rick, any thoughts on this? Well, our our short-term plan was, you know, to get the facility open safely for our members and staff. Do we have our physical barriers in place uh, in, in those areas, reception desks, workstations, places like that? Um, do we have doors, uh, you know, doors, doors needed to be open wherever possible. So the only doors that required someone to physically open were the, the, the entrance doors to the facility, entrance and exit doors to the facility. Everything else uh, where possible, we had propped open locker rooms, restrooms, gymnasiums, because you have to go in and around the corner and that worked out uh, very well to do that. And of course, uh, you know, social and physical distance markings everywhere. Um, I think it was, I think that part was easy. 
because you know people were conditioned because retailers were already using that and it isn't like people were unaccustomed to social distance markings and directions and signage so that was received very well from the membership once we did open in June. We moved a lot of uh, physical fitness equipment around, a lot of hand sanitizing stations. These are all things that we did uh, prior to opening for the first, reopening for the first time. And then our communication that went out to the membership, we really emphasized the safety aspect. Um, you know, that we are safe and, you know, come in and check us out. Uh, we, we require all members to scan, not only scan in, but to scan out. And we have an app that they can have on, the, it's hooked up with the Y app, where any member can, can look on their phone and see what the member load in the facility is in real time. So whether they can, whether they want to come or not, nah, there might be a few too many people in the facility. I'd rather, I'd rather wait till it's a little quieter. They can just look on their phone and we've had real good, real positive feedback for that. In the midterm plans, we just began opening up more of our facility. So midsummer, we opened up uh, what we called our phase two reopening. And that's where we opened areas like pools, gymnasiums on a reservation basis, our courts, um, where before those areas were closed when we opened for the first six weeks. And then our long-term plan consists of a lot of recovery planning. And what's this new normal going to look like? We've set up some planning teams, uh, recovery planning teams for membership program facilities. And for facilities, you know, we know that we know the revenue stream may be different due to reduced membership levels. So we may have, um, we may not have the, the financial resources we once did. And what kind of an effect is this going to have on our, 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 in our department? Are we going to have to restructure some staffing, some duties they're doing? Uh, we did lose some staff through attrition. Some people who decided, you know, I don't feel comfortable coming back to the Y and I'm almost retirement age anyway. I'm just going to stay away. Uh, we didn't replace those staff and we're just kind of picking up the slack uh, for those staff. And there's about three staff in this department. Some capital projects may need to be deferred. Uh, we still keep looking at energy saving opportunities. Um, you know, we like to think of ourselves as experts with our building automation system and have made some significant savings just by the way we operate the facility. But also when we looked at capital, capital planning and um, energy savings. I was contacted by one of our Focus on Energy advisors um, trying to say, let's, let's look and see if we can do a project. I may have free money to hand out to do this. So we're trying to identify that because many people are not utilizing those services now. So we are in the process of seeing if we can get some no interest financing to do a relatively short return on investment project um, and we're going to just wait and see. Hopefully we can, we can still do that. So those kind of plans. Good. Great comments, Rick. Thank you. Will, how about you? How are you addressing this? Sure. Well, um, we're based in North Carolina and uh, we were really closed mostly to members until say early July. Um, and in that point in time, we were able to open our pools and we did um, appointment based uh, lane, uh, you know, usage. Um, really our locker rooms were closed. And, and the next thing that we decided was like, we have to find a way for folks to, uh, to work out in our facilities or at, outside. So we set up a giant tent, like a 40 foot by 50 foot tent uh, with social distancing squares in it and put a big shipping container out there full of uh, our equipment. And, you know, we really feel like we hope to continue that into the future. That it's a great way for folks Right now, while we don't really know the duration of uh, this pandemic timeline, um, folks may be more comfortable working outside into many months from now. So, so we hope to continue that. We've, we've been doing uh, virtual classes. We've taught more than 600 virtual fitness classes online. Uh, we hope to continue that too. I mean, we see um, the why without walls and, and, and reaching people from the community just anywhere. And so, I feel like there's a lot of things that we've learned 
through uh, this COVID era that are going to continue on. Um, one important thing when we reopened was uh, also just making sure that we we're communicating the work that was done in the interim. Because when folks weren't here, um, like we've communicated it to our staff, we communicated it to our supervisors, but we haven't communicated it to our members. So um, we created a reopening page on our webpage that just uh, detailed all of the safety uh, precautions that we are going through um, to make sure that everyone's safe uh, when they re-enter. Um, so, so again, we're going to keep that going into the future as well. I think I hear from both of you too that uh, even though we have been challenged, uh, it has provided some opportunities and I'm glad to hear both of you comment on that. Thank you. Here we go. If you would have been able to predict the pandemic, what would you have done differently to better prepare, perhaps? And what are some of the key things you feel need to be addressed to better prepare for something like this moving forward? Rick, are you going to start this one for us? Yep, I can. <clears throat> well, the supply chain created many challenges. Um, as you know, many, many supplies were in demand, um, just seemed to happen overnight. And I think one of the things that I would suggest is to have a backup vendor list for critical suppliers. Even though you have a good relationship with existing vendors, uh, include multiple vendors for these critical supplies. And there really is no substitute for having, for having good vendors. You know, we, you know, we can't always just say, oh, I'm just gonna go on Amazon and see what I can find. Uh, vendor relationships are very important. The other thing is being a champion of your building operating systems. And, and the reason I say that is, is so that we could make changes rather quickly once this, once this came down and understand our systems, being able to understand how to operate the building in a way that is going to save us some money. Because it's going to be different operating a facility that is closed or partially open than it is for a regular operating facility. And I like, to, I like to say it like uh, to keep competent in your building automation system, lighting controls and pool control systems. And, and what I mean by competent is, you know, there's a difference between being current and competent. Um, I happen to be a pilot and I am current because I have to have, I have to have a review every two years. However, if I haven't flown in two months, I'm probably not as competent as I should be and I need to go out and so I need to keep active in this stuff. If I'm, if I'm think a building automation system is, you know, is what it implies, it's an automation system, I don't have to do anything. Well, there really are things that we have to do and we have to monitor and we have to keep learning how to operate the system so that when we get into a time like this, uh, we are able to to make the changes without having to, oh boy, I got to look back, I got to call for help, uh, I've got to get a controls tech in here or something to help me out. So I think that is very, very helpful. Um, if you can just, just keep up on all of your systems. You know, an example was my pool controllers automatically drive my VFDs to control the flow rates. So I wanted to change, change to a 10 hour turnover uh, so I can save a lot of energy dollars there on my water pumping, but it took me some time to make these adjustments that I was seeking. Um, I have since written the procedure down, um, typed it up, put it into the dude, um, have it in a document file so that I can reference that if I need to in the future. So, so I guess the short, short statement is, you know, keep competent on those operating systems. Great points. Uh, great points there, Rick. Thank you. Will, what do you have to add to this? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with what Rick's saying. Um, when he was mentioning the building shutdown processes, uh, be it the setbacks on his pools um, or just uh, changing your setbacks on your HVAC systems, like a like an eight degree setback is what we did here. Um, and, and that's saving energy and saving money. And, uh, you know, while there's no one in the building except for a couple staff, that's a great thing to do. But having that process be documented and um, 
and able to be checked off as you go uh, to document that that you have done all these things. Um, I know facility dudes sent out a pointer and an email um, shortly after this has been going on of, of best practices for shutting down your building. Well, now we have all of that documented for, let's hope not, but for the next time that this has to happen, we'll have it all systematically there. And we'll be able to, to shut down everything uh, as required. And then the restart process uh, is just as important. So, so having that scheduled as well. Um, and, and like, and like uh, Rick said, just having those non-perishable supplies, um, having as much of those as you can handle in your storeroom and with the perishable, perishable supplies, making sure that you know when the expiration is and, and having those vendor relations. So I, I second everything. That sounds great. Great comments. Great comments. Thank you both of you for giving those highlights. You gave me and I'm sure those that are listening and will be listening some great highlights. Thank you so much. We really appreciate Rick and um, Will for being part of our webinar today. As we um, come to a close and we're almost at our hour, just want to share with you some resources. We do have a pandemic specific resources for you. This is the link. If you would like to get more information, um, you can go here. Also, though we don't have time for um, our audience Q&A, I would invite you that if you have questions or comments that you would like for us, or perhaps our panelist, uh, panelists to address, uh, please send them in to us. Uh, we want to hear from you. We do these webinars so that uh, we can all gain information, particularly during this time when uh, we have, we've come a long ways, but we don't know what the future holds. We here at DUDE want to be here for you at all times. And in doing so, we uh, want to do whatever it is that we can do to service you. We thank you for your time today, and we look forward to our future partnership with you. And if at any time we can provide services for you, we want to do that. Thank you again, and good luck with, uh, um, with the future and what you are doing. We appreciate your entrepreneurial style that you are uh, utilizing and how you're using the software to better serve not only your why, but really you're, you're serving the whole community. Thank you from Dude for all that you do. Have a great day. Bye.